Now I'm very happy to welcome our today's speaker, Jörg Wintjes, who studies um, Greek, Latin and history at the Julius Maximilians University in Würzburg. While he did his master thesis in modern history, he changed for his dissertation to antiquity uh, and wrote uh, his dissertation about the life of Ivanius, an ancient late Roman Latin author. <clears throat> and he had several positions at the Institute for Ancient History at the University in Würzburg, where he also did his habilitation two years ago about um, Roman naval warfare in northern northwest Europe. And that hints directly more or less to the topic of tonight, because this work already dealt with ancient naval warfare and all different aspects. I'm very happy that you're here and presenting some aspects about Greek <coughs> naval history and introducing us to um, simulations as a matter of um, discussion and scientific approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I have to begin with a couple of apologies. Um, first of all, you may note that the title on the first slide slightly differs from the title as it was announced in, uh, on the web page of the Digital Classes Seminar. That is because I thought that the title I had originally come up with conveyed the idea that we already had some sort of results, whereas um, our project, which is still in its initial stages, has created quite a large number of questions uh, regarding its methodology. And it's mainly about these questions that I'll talk tonight. So, the second apology would be if you have come here um, with an added desire to find out the latest about uh, you know, simulation technology as it could be adopted for researching ancient naval warfare, then I have to disappoint you. There is not a lot of um, tele uh, technologically orientated material in my talk. And third, I have to apologize because I caught a fairly nasty cold and I'm not quite sure whether my uh, voice will actually hold throughout this, but um, you just see about that. Now, ancient history is to some extent maritime history. If we understand the ancient world as it is, as the world ranging from the northern coast of Scotland um, to the Gamanda Liberat or well, something off map on the right hand side, um, it's a world that is uh, to a great extent dominated by the sea and ancient history is greatly dominated by maritime activity of course and anything that is anything where maritime activity has a great part in the world we also have naval activity having a great part in that. Um, indeed, even if you look into standard, older standard uh, works of reference on ancient naval history, they will usually come to an end around um, the end of the Roman Republic, but even if you uh, push on into uh, the Roman Empire, you'll find that in the first four centuries AD, you'll still have a huge amount of large-scale naval activity going on all throughout the Mediterranean, um, on the shores of the Okeanos, in the Red Sea, wherever you want it. So, naval warfare, and particularly large-scale naval warfare, by which I mean um, actions that involve dozens, if not hundreds, of ships, and consequentially thousands of men, um, naval warfare on that scale is something that happens very regularly in ancient history. Now, we can say quite a lot about ancient naval warfare, and obviously it's not exactly the world's most understudied subject. We can say, as I've already done, that naval warfare has a very prominent place in ancient history. If we think about um, the history of, for example, Athens is, history, uh, that's it, uh, is a history that is characterized 
to a great extent by naval warfare and the, the application of um, and exertion of sea power. Um, this importance of naval warfare obviously is then reflected by quite a number of sources from which we can try to deconstruct ancient naval warfare. We have quite a large amount of literary evidence, um, but not only literary evidence. There, there is quite a large amount of epigraphic and documentary evidence. If you do research um, onto, let's say, the Athenian Empire, you'll find there is quite a large amount of um, documentary evidence on the Athenian fleet, for example. We have a large amount of iconographic evidence, depictions of ships ranging from the beginning in the, uh, the archaic period, were all right down to the uh, to late antiquity, and obviously also there is archaeological evidence ranging from evidence for mm. the necessary infrastructure you need for um, large scale naval warfare like ship sheds, uh, right down to actual shipwrecks. So that is actually a very, uh, very pleasant thing to state. Third thing we should think about, and this then will lead us to some other truth, truths that are not so pleasant, is that naval warfare is something very complex. If you have, let's say, a phalanx of 10,000 men and you put them onto the field, then you do not need a fairly large field, and basically you have your 10,000 men and that's it. If you have a fleet of 100 triremes, not only do you need a fairly large space on the sea for actually putting these 100 triremes, the amount of infrastructure and the amount of logistical support you need for keeping these 100 triremes running um, by far exceeds the amount of logistical infrastructure you need for keeping an army of an equivalent in hot lights running. So naval warfare, um, due to its um, highly technical character, is tends to be more complex than land warfare. Now, if we think about what we actually know about ancient land warfare and ancient um, naval warfare, then obviously we could say, as I've just shown you, we have all this nice evidence. We have literary evidence about battles at sea. We have documentary evidence about how the Athenians bought cloths for their sails. We have shipwrecks and things like that. If we assume that um, originally what could be known about warfare was 100%, so that's complete knowledge of land and sea warfare in antiquity. That's what the ancients knew. Um, then I venture to say that um, when it comes to technology alone, that is, how did the equipment look like? And what could the equipment do? Um, when you look at ancient land warfare, we probably approach something like 20 to 30 to 35 percent at most that we actually know completely or partly of how it looked like and how it worked. So, for a third at most of what originally was there in terms of military technology on land, we actually still know of. When it comes to sea warfare, we realize that 5 to 10 percent is probably still wildly optimistic. Because once you leave the classical period, the reality is that we have not a good idea about how the ships actually look like. We have not a good idea about what they actually did, how they were actually equipped, because our evidence tends uh, to pattern out dramatically. And once you are in the Roman Empire, you'll find that they have one by one with triremes and whatever that may actually mean, because trireme is just the term. It could mean that the ship looks just the same like it looked 400 BC, and it could mean that, you know, Look at the model frigate and compare it to the compare to the Napoleonic frigate. Terms can have a very long life, and uh, terminology is something that, um, in systems that are inherently very conservative, like military systems, um, terminology can have a very long life. 
um, using and describing things that were totally different from when the term was initially used. Um, and that is only about technology. Warfare um, is only partly about technology. Actually, you could argue that warfare is mainly not about technology, but about what I'm going to do with my technology, about operations. And um, when it comes to operations, things do not look very well, positive indeed, because when it comes to land operations, we'll suddenly find that we have huge gaps missing in our, in our knowledge. We know very little about command and control in the nation by We can make adjustments by you know, gathering hundreds of reenactment people and uh, then simply try things out. Um, but there are still huge gaps in our knowledge. With naval warfare, I, would, I, I have um, raised the uh, this blue color a little bit just, just so that it's there. Personally, I would say our knowledge about ancient naval operations, our operational knowledge, is basically nil. Um, because we, we simply do not actually know what they, um, what exactly they did and how they did it. And that is a major problem. Because if everything I told you before that is true, that the ancient world is one that is characterized to a great extent by maritime activity, that maritime activity in turn sort of um, results in naval activity becoming important, that therefore naval activity is important for, the, for ancient history, for understanding ancient history, and this means that the key for understanding this naval activity is not with us at the moment. And so we come to a couple of rather unpleasant truths about ancient naval warfare. Um, the first one is that we know a little bit about ancient land warfare, um, but we know, uh, we know much less about ancient naval warfare. And um, this is most obvious in, uh, when it comes to technology. Um, we have much more information left about land warfare technology than about naval warfare technology. Um, but obviously the, most, the biggest problem is we have almost no operational knowledge about ancient naval, uh, ancient naval warfare. There is no corpus of ancient naval tactical acts, for example. We have, um, it, it's not that we have a huge corpus of land warfare texts either, but it, we have at least a couple of texts where you can gain some sort of insight into what actually happened on the battlefield. If you take a text like Arianus of um, Nicomedia's um, Contra Alanos, for example, <coughs> This is an important text telling us something about how different forces with different capabilities could work together on the battlefield. We have nothing like that about naval warfare. Even if on the naval battlefield, you have exactly the same problem. <clears throat> so, in the end, we have a huge gap of knowledge. Uh, that is very important for our overall picture of what ancient naval warfare should actually be about, or what ancient naval warfare is, and that is a major problem. Now, up to this point, I was very sort of um, theoretically minded about it. Let me just illustrate this with one example. And that's one of these minor engagements you might have heard of. Um, the so-called Battle of Cave Economos, which is um, variously known as the biggest sea battle human history has ever seen, uh, depending how you define big. Um, the Battle of Cave Economos, between, uh, which happened in 256 BC, on one hand, the Romans trying to launch an invasion force um, into Africa, it was Carthage, on the other hand, you have the Carthaginians trying to prevent that and to intercept this Roman force. Now, we know from Polybius that the Carthaginians had about 350 ships and the Romans had around 330 ships. 
And Polybius gives us a fairly detailed account um, of the Roman, if you want, battle of disposition, which was not like that. He had this vaguely cuneiform, uh, the Roman uh, had this vaguely cuneiform battle of disposition. They had four squadrons, the first two squadrons probably slightly bigger than the third and fourth squadron. Um, the first two put at an angle, the third squadron guarding the transports, particularly the horse transports, and the fourth, uh, fourth squadron then guarding the back of the whole thing. Um, and, and that's actually quite important, um, Polybius says so, this is the formation with which the Romans planned to cross uh, the Mediterranean in order to get to North Africa. So that's not a battle formation. That's a formation for going across the sea for a long distance. <coughs> now, the uh, Carthaginians tried to prevent that, had a fairly different formation, four squadrons um, stretch up like that in order to, I mean, in order to envelop the, the Romans in some way or another and try to get to the back of the Roman formation. What eventually happened is, beside the point here, the Romans in the end won a huge victory and then actually made it to North Africa, um, only then to find out that their uh, heroic leader, Tius Regulus, was not quite up to the job of leading the army in Africa. What's important here is that in nearly every reconstruction of that battle you will find in the literature. You can see the stages. That's all based on Polybius. You'll always find either a scale of one kilometer, sometimes one mile, sometimes one nautical mile, in relation to the back, usually in relation to the back of the Roman formation. So that, that would be the suggestion. The back of the Roman formation would probably be at most one kilometer wide. Which already is quite formation. I mean, one kilometer wide. Um, imagine you are an admiral, or a squadron commander, or whatever, um, <clears throat> and you are somewhere, either in the middle or at one of the ends of your formation, and have to be aware of what happens at the other side, at the other end of your formation, or at the end of your formation, if you are in the middle. So, how does information travel up and down these, these linear things? It's an interesting question when such a formation is one kilometer wide. <coughs> Unfortunately, as you'll see, uh, this is a rather daunting hypothesis saying that this is only one kilometer because um, Greek remains, and that's the ships uh, um, Olivia has actually talk, uh, talk about, uh, talks about, are rather big. We assume, and these are standard figures taken from the literature, that they are, have been sort of at least five meters wide. The hull, that is. You know, from one end of the outrigger to the other. They have oars. So from one end of the outermost oar to the other end from the outermost oar, you have at least about 10 meters. Probably more, because these numbers are taken from, ultimately uh, derived from experiments with a trireme construction more of which later. But let's just stick with these numbers, 10 meters. So, if, I was, if we are stuck with 10 meters, and I have I just assume that these squadrons have 75 ships each, which would be, if you divide the total roughly by four, then the two squadrons that form the front of the, of the of this cuneiform formation, they would have around 150 ships. Now, 150 ships in this formation will already be 750 meters. Um, now, that's not going to work, obviously. Um, I mean, a pontoon bridge. You could build a pontoon bridge with, with print marine surface is 750 meters wide. If you take a formation where the blades, the tips of the blades of the oars, just touch each other. And one hundred ships already 
require 100 to 1,500 meters. But again, that's obviously a totally impossible formation. It's totally impossible and totally unthinkable that anyone would actually run the risk of total chaos, particularly if you may in mind that the Roman formation is not one for immediate action. It's a, it's a formation planned for crossing the Mediterranean, going uh, to the shore of North Africa. So there must be some sort of fairly substantial spacing between of that. Now, if we look at, if we look again at that, and assume that there is something like half a ship length in between these, in, in between each ship, there will be something like 15 meters between each ship. Then we are already talking for the first and second squadron um, of three and three quarters of a kilometer. Uh, no, three kilometers and uh, uh, three quarters of a kilometer. If we assume that there is one ship length between each ship, that will be around 30 meters, just as a safety measure for not creating chaos because you are trying to cross the Mediterranean, you have a formation that is six kilometers wide. And your commander angle is just in the middle of that formation. How does command and control work under these circumstances? I have no idea. But if I want to understand how ancient naval warfare actually works, I should have a very specific idea, because that is what naval operations are all about. Naval operations are not necessarily about understanding the technology of the ships. I mean, that's important too. But naval operations are mainly about understanding how all these pieces actually fit into place, how they work together with each other, and how someone who is in command of all this is able to keep some sort of control over something that may be, you know, six kilometers by whatever, four kilometers? When six by four kilometers, you're talking about a whole formation of 24 square kilometers. That's just the Roman formation. The Carthaginian formation, if you follow Libyans, is 350 ships basically strung out in one huge line of all these ships in the West. That's, what, 12 kilometers, 50 kilometers? I have no idea. The thing is, if we can, if we can prove that this is impossible, then obviously the numbers are wrong. But unless we can prove that this is impossible, we have, you cannot simply say, well, I don't believe that, so the numbers must be wrong. Um, you have to prove that this is impossible before you can say, well, I'll just you know, take all the things I learned during my training as a classicist and just sort of change the text of Libyus. Um, that's a nice solution, but that's one that you can only use when you are very sure that this is impossible. As I said, I have no solution to this. Um, I'm always using this as an example to show how at the end, how little we at the end know about ancient naval operations. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we tried to find, when thinking about uh, naval operations, try to find some sort of, um, I wouldn't really say normative, but rather alternative approach of finding more about um, what ancient naval operations um, are about. So, which brings me to the second part of my thought, uh, of my talk. Are simulations a possible solution to the problems we face? One could argue that, given the fact that simulations are nowadays everywhere, um, it might be fairly easy for, let's say, having a simulation like the spot of Kedeknos, and then simply try various things out, and then we'll see what happens. And that initially was the idea that sort of kickstarted all this. Um, 
But very soon, uh, we ran in a, into a couple of rather nasty problems, which will uh, more of which uh, in a moment. Now, simulations, and I brought you a picture of ENIAC, which is arguably one of the first uh, really big and useful computers in the world, which has been used in the mid 1940s by the US Air Force for um, ballistic simulations. So, simulations, uh, simulations are something that have been around for quite some time, and we know a lot about simulations, we know a lot about what simulations can do, and we know a lot about what simulations cannot do. Um, usually, simulations are uh, grouped into physical simulations and interactive simulations. You all know physical simulations, um, that are these nice things that allow to uh, predict the cause of environmental change. Um, if you uh, have a <coughs> specific model and then put data into it, it will show you how coastlines change, things like that. And then obviously if you know how uh, the basic laws of physics being as they are and um, being not very prone to some changes, um, obviously physical simulations also allow you to validate the reconstruction of technology, of architecture, of whatever. If you want to know whether Tower and Hadrian's Wall had 27 stories or just three, um, and you run a physical simulation, it will probably tell you that anything above three stories will topple over, and, and that's it. For this, simulations are perfect. And indeed, if I want to sort of reconstruct an ancient warship based on certain data I already have, I could also do that with a physical simulation, which could tell me, tell me for example, what the limit of the length of the hull would be before um, severe hogging would set in and then the hull would not be watertight anymore or things like that. But this is just if you want the testing, ultimately the testing of objects, uh, of objects about which we know a lot. We know a lot about stones, how much they weigh. We know a lot about <coughs> constant architecture. Uh, we know a lot about the, the physics of architecture. We know a lot about um, the problems of um, uh, uh, static problems and things like that. Much more interesting when it comes to operations are uh, interactive simulations. Now, interactive simulations <coughs> today use almost everywhere to train human decision makers. One of the most common type of interactive simulation is a simulation where a sequence of events is influenced by, at various points throughout the simulation by decisions made by humans. And then you can see, well, you have human A making certain decisions and we have outcome A. Human B making certain decisions and we have outcome B. And then you compare the outcomes and you can see how important these decisions are, um, whether they actually have uh, any impact or not. Um, which means that you can both teach a lot with interactive simulations and you can actually learn quite a bit about the impact of certain um, ways of decision making. You can also use interactive simulations to analyze whether a process or a system is prone to failure due to wrong decision making or whether the system will not keep on working even if uh, uh, humans make all sorts of funny decisions. So that is actually what we, what we need. We need an interactive simulation that allows us systems analysis. You know, if, you, if, if we understand an ancient fleet as a system, systems analysis is what we need. There is but one very grave problem. Systems analysis means you analyze a system that you actually know, and you just want to know what can it do. What's it, uh, um, you, you want to know where are the limits of its performance, and you want to know how liable is the system you already know to some sort of input that is unpredictable, i.e., the human decision makers. My ancient fleet 
We have a system we know nearly nothing about. We know it's a system, but we do not know how it actually works. So, interactive simulations used for systems analysis uh, are usually used when you actually can see through the system and see how the system works and then analyze each element of the system um, in relation to the um, decision making by the humans. The problem that we face when talking about ancient naval warfare is that ancient naval operations present a system or systems, whatever you want, that we cannot see through, at least not see through easily. And in, in, when talking about systems analysis, we could obviously argue, uh, argue that a fleet would be a system. Uh, you could obviously also argue that a squadron, like the ones I've shown you, a squadron is a system. Um, the trouble with naval warfare is, and has always been, if you look into the history of conflict simulation, um, simulations are used since the late 1880s as training instruments for naval officers. And um, ever since the 1880s, um, those involved in running these simulations have faced the problem that even the ship itself is a fairly com com uh, complex system. Um, but this all sort of shows us we do not even understand how the individual ship actually works. We do understand that at least partly when it comes to 5th century Chinese warfare. But going back to Cape Ecnomus, to the Romans and the Catholic Indians, um, we do not exactly know how the Primperium actually worked. We do not even actually know how, after 256, naval warfare, once the Corvus um, was apparently done away with by the Romans, um, how naval warfare has been worked. We know even less about how the Romans used squadrons, or the Catholic Indians used squadrons for operating something, and we know even less about putting all these squadrons together to fleet. So instead of having simply a three-layered system, which I can use, of which I can analyze parts, or, or which I can analyze as a whole, I have three layers of things about which I know far too little for a proper systems analysis. So the, the, the main problem here is simulation is a perfect instrument for analyzing a system. It's a perfect instrument for analyzing a system um, that I know about how it actually works. But the problem with ancient naval warfare is I do not know how the system works. And if I do not know how the system works, then I can run into difficulties with my simulation. Which leads me to some not so uh, nice things that one has to say about simulations. Um, interactive simulations are used not only for analyzing systems and processes, but also for training decision makers and obviously for transmitting um, knowledge of processes. We use uh, interactive simulations, for example, in museums, um, etc. But this only works, obviously, if these processes or systems are known in any detail, and that is, as I said, not the case with engineering operations. The main problem is, when we use simulations for analyzing systems, we see that interactive simulations for analyzing systems we see that there is some sort of input by human decision maker, and that changes the outcome of the simulation, um, of the result. We expect a different result because we know how, this, how, the, how the system works. We know what actually should be the result. So our expectations is the result of our functional knowledge of the system. But we do not have such a functional knowledge when it comes to ancient naval operations. So even if we had a working simulation of ancient naval operations, and we have little way of actually validating the results, 
because we have no firm uh, ground on which to put our, uh, our expectations, which is another very unsettling thought. And then obviously, um, interactive simulations work best if they are constructed from things that are well known, and if the, the one and the only variable is the human input. That's the ideal situation. You have a system, and the only difference is you have human A with input A producing result A, human B with input B with, uh, producing result B, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, um, with ancient labor operations, we have far too many variables, I would say, to feel comfortable. Uh, comfortable. Um, and that we know any factors for sure with ancient labor operations is something that, um, well, I, I wouldn't bet a fortune on. So, which raises the question why I'm here? Because what, I'm, what I've told you so far is A, ancient labor operations are old. B, we know almost nothing about them. And C, simulations, which we may think are, may, may think are instinctively a, a good way of finding something about, out about them, in fact are, well, not so obviously good at finding something about them. And nevertheless, um, we actually want to try that. And so in the remaining minutes of my talk, I just want to I give you a brief overview about our project and about um, what we actually want to do. We, that is um, the Lehrstuhlfeindgeschichte at the Julius Maximilian Universität Würzburg and um, the Royal Holloway College, um, University of London and King's College. Um, that is the main starting point of um, of our project, the famous trial ring reconstruction Olympias. Now, Olympias, which is gives a fairly nice set of, of dimensions and from which you can take uh, a fairly nice amount of um, particularly interesting performance data. Olympias was originally built to um, solve the centuries old riddle that that had um, not only bothered classicists and historians, um, but also, uh, also emperors, at least one um, of the last French emperor. Um, and that is how did ancient triumphs actually work. Olympias was constructed as a, as was one of all this, as floating hypothesis on how a triumph could actually work with regard to the rowing system. And it's important to understand that it was never meant to be a fully functional triangle reconstruction. And that it was never meant to be a uh, reconstruction that had the uh, full technical capability of an ancient triangle. It was mainly meant to show that um, this is a workable reconstruction and this is the, the only really, really plausible way of putting the oarsman into such a, such a ship. Um, we know now, uh, nowadays that um, there is probably something wrong with the dimensions. The ship may just be a little bit too short, um, but it's, we are talking about a couple of meters here. So round about that is the ball game we are talking about when it comes to ancient triremes, which means that when we are talking about performance of such a vessel, uh, we can say that the performance data we get out of the Olympias is at least, well, I would say um, with a fair amount of imprecision, at least about in the area of an ancient trial. We cannot say what the actual performance of an ancient trial was simply because we do not have one. That certainly is not a perfect construction. And obviously, we do not have, and will never have, 
ancient roads, um, which is a major problem that um, has bothered uh, Thomas Rucker and others uh, ever since they actually built this thing. Uh, these uh, reconstructions are always screwed with modern rollers, um, and you will never be able to to find out how um, well, what the, the technical capability of such a vessel was with an ancient crew. Now, with the performance data, what we can do is create a sort of tactical model of the Um that allows us to basically drive it around at sea. This is to some extent important because the actual nucleus will probably never see uh, the water again. She's now stored on land. Um, the hull is, after a couple of bosch repair attempts, not really seaworthy anymore. <coughs> and the Germanic Navy is unlikely to um, put enough money into her again to make it seaworthy. So the hard reality is Olympias will probably never float anymore and will not be available for any tests in the moment. So creating a a model of Olympias that you can use for very basic tactical testings um, would be a very interesting thing. And as always to bear in mind that what we then have is a model of Olympias, which in itself is not a model of a trial but rather a, well, this floating hypothesis about how the old system of the trial um, then, of course, we have, if we come through the literary evidence, we find that we have some information on certain operational, um, certain tactical maneuvers, even if there is no tactical literature on that. Um, what we can take from literary sources is often uh, very fragmented, a lot of detail is often um, fairly poor, even though we have, there are some sort of uh, maneuvers that we know about, like the Viet Plus, uh, for which the, the project is named, um, or the Kyklos, actually debated Kyklos is the sort of easier to say, but um, I thought that pushing through would be the, be the better name for a project rather than running in a circle. Um, again, here, um, this is one of the standard. Uh, standard graphics you can see when it comes to discussing the good loss. Uh, no one has really explained how this will actually work in, in reality and how much command and control it requires to get this actually going. Uh, particularly not if you are if you have a commander and you have positions something like here or even here. So um, one of the questions thinking about all these things um, that, that, that thinking about all these things raises is what actually is the situation of awareness of someone who's trying to get 24 ships like that into such a formation? How does that actually work? Um, so, situational awareness is one thing that we, once we have this basic, if you want, model of Olympias, then we want to sort of um, multiply Olympias and then have simply several um, Olympiae to sort of play around with and then try um, to see what we can do with them formation-wise. And again, um, in the beginning this will be playing around with them fairly openly because um, we know so little about how actually, uh, what actually happened at, um, on an operational level and for example if you take a quick loss, um, what actually the, the operational method was of getting into this formation. Um, finally, the idea of the project is that once we have established some sort of, of technical procedures by using uh, several Olympia, if you want, then we can transfer this so, uh, Hellenistic polyremes and later polyremes and the ones of the um, At least that's the general idea. Personally, um, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical about whether that will actually work because we know so little about, particularly 
later hellenistic ships about the, uh, about the Roman Polynesians. Um, they may have been about as big as uh, Olympias. They may have been, well, have been bigger than Olympias. Uh, we know so little about Roman ship sheds that we can't really say whether the Roman uh, big Roman prickery was 35 meters to 40 meters, perhaps in 42 meters. Um, so, well, this, this third step um, really will eventually sort of um, see the light of the day is still a matter of debate. What is realistic, though, is first of all creating this model of Olympias and then trying to explore uh, what can be done with several of them um, on a technical level, first on a technical level, and then once we have sort of mastered what you can do with small scroll and then going up onto a operational level where you have several dozens of these ships. The end result will include some sort of, um, let's say, user front end that will try to convey a certain amount of situation awareness, um, which means that um, we eventually aim at something where you um, can get the impression of what it would be like to stand on the deck of such a ship once these formations get in the way. Uh, with the explicit aim of finding out what can you actually see and how little can you actually see. And particularly when, you know, once the masts are down, basically it's standing on the deck and then trying to control everything from there. Does that work, or uh, can, can that, in which way would that work? Uh, these are the questions that we'll um, probably have to deal with um, once we go, go through this. Um, let me conclude by saying I haven't told you a lot about how the, the, the end result of the project will be, simply because we are now in the very initial stages of that. And if I have sounded slightly skeptical on the capabilities of simulations, um, then it's not because I'm um, fundamentally skeptical about them. Um, rather, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can make some use of them. Um, but I think we have to be aware of um, the fact that they have serious limitations when it comes to systems that are very poorly understood. And I find it very important to, to face the fact that we know very little about ancient naval warfare. Hopefully, um, what we are going to do uh, over the next couple of years will change this slightly. Um, but nevertheless, um, for now, the fact remains that naval warfare, one of ancient history's more important bits, um, is well, not only woefully understood, but uh, even more importantly, um, woefully um, misunderstood, rather not understood at all. Thank you.